Mike Utley was born to play football. I wanted to be bigger, I wanted to be stronger, I wanted to be meaner, tougher than anyone I've ever competed against. But his career, and almost his life, was cut short in one devastating blow. I could just tell the look in his eyes, you know, it was fear, it was panic. I knew I was in serious, serious trouble. Usually we consider when somebody has that kind of significant confession that the damage could be permanent. But Mike would prove the doubters wrong and regain control of his body awesome, and his life. He's so larger than life that you don't even notice his wheelchair. Mike goes through his life with joy. He goes through his life fearless, and he goes through his life working his ass off to achieve a goal. That's the legacy. Don't tell me I cannot do anything. I miss football more today than I did 13 years ago. I miss the game of competing against the best of the best. Football put me in a wheelchair. But football is also gonna teach me how to get out. Pay any price, I've always believed that. I will pay any price to get what I want. I will find a way to win. In 1965, Frank and Irene Utley gave birth to a baby boy who would one day become a giant of a man. The smallest baby, but the largest child, six pounds, three ounces. He was a delightful eater. I, anything I put in front of him, all of my children, they always ate well. I had two older brothers. They were bigger, or I had to fight and scratch for every little morsel there was. He is a determined kid. I would want to help him to button his shirt or to tie his shoes, but he would uh, always say, no, me own self. And so ever since then, we called him me own guy because he wanted to do everything himself. I started playing football when I was seven years old. He grew fast. By the time he was nine years old, he was too big for his age limit, and he ended up with 13-year-old kids. That was really a disadvantage for him because they were so much more mature. So he didn't play football much after that until he got in high school. Mike attended Seattle's JFK High, where he was captain of the football and basketball teams. My position was power forward. I was more of a bruiser. You have the Michael Jordans of high school. I was more like a uh, Mike Tyson. I led the league in foul shots, but I also led the uh, league in uh, personal fouls. But it was as an offensive lineman that the six foot six, 250 pounder garnered the most attention. After my senior year in high school, it was college just started knocking, basically. I chose Washington State University. Mike received a full scholarship and set out to prove that he deserved it. After he was playing football for a while, he would come home and he would be all bruised. And then he would have to go back and take a test maybe the next morning. I remember telling him, uh, Mike, if you don't want to do this, we'll pay Washington State for the scholarship and you can just bag it. And he said, Mom, I want to play football. Even at 250 pounds, Mike was considered light. To succeed in college, and eventually the NFL, he would have to break the 300-pound barrier. Even before the guys were 300 pounds, I knew inside my heart 300 pounds was the key. I had to gain at least 70 pounds. Mike gained the weight, and Washington State gained respect. As a senior, Mike led them to their best finish since 1929. He was named MVP of the Hula Bowl, and soon after, he was drafted by the NFL's Detroit Lions. The dreams and all the hard work and the blood, sweat, and tears 
that I gave during my college career, my high school, and my peewee football has all come true. I finally made it. We just all helped and, and pushed and pulled each other along into uh, he was ready to step in and take over at the starting job. Utley at 6'6", 279, has been called the Lions' most promising young offensive lineman. Blocking for future Hall of Famer Barry Sanders, Mike got off to a great start. But injuries would force him to miss more than half the year, and most of the next season as well. Unbowed, he approached his third season with renewed enthusiasm. New season, expectations were high. It was a big deal when he came back. Uh, he, he was a big part of our unit. We wanted him in there, we needed him in there. After 10 games, Mike was leading one of the top-ranked offensive units in the league. I was strong. I thought the injuries were all over with. But then the 11th game of the season came. That's when my, my life changed forever. First play of the fourth quarter, Eric Kramer brings us into a huddle. We get, we get the play. We called a deep crossing route, so I believe it was to Robert Clark. All of a sudden, the ball is snapped. I'm taking on Tracy Rocker. He raises his arms up to block the ball when Eric goes to throw. Go to take his legs out. He grabs my shoulders, pulls me down. I hit my head on the turf. Robert Clark cuts in the back of the end zone, and, and we get a touchdown out of it. We're back on the sidelines celebrating, and all of a sudden, the game stopped. Because I didn't see Mike. Mike was always one of the first ones there. And uh, I remember seeing him laying on the field. And you could see something was seriously, seriously wrong. I remember standing over and looking at it in his eyes and saying, Big Daddy, are you OK? And uh, I could just tell the look in his eyes, he just you know, it was fear. I had a burning sensation from my mid chest down, like you stepped into a raging fire. But the worst yet, I could not move my legs. I couldn't sit up. I lost all strength through my whole body. And Coach Fonts came up to me. He goes, son, can you feel that? I said, no, sir. Son, I'm tapping your leg. Can you feel that? I'm tapping your belly. Can you feel that? I go, no, sir, I can't. The team doc called for the stretcher. I knew I was in serious, serious trouble. A doctor comes into my room and all of a sudden says, son, you broke your neck and you'll never walk again. His entire life, Mike Utley sought to perfect his body. He trained and sculpted his physique until he was a 315-pound, one-man wrecking crew. But in an instant, so fast the cameras couldn't even catch it, he lost all control over his lifelong work. There was eerie silence to the whole stadium. But as soon as they put me up on the stretcher and they were wheeling me out, the crowd cheered. That's when I gave the crowd a thumbs up, let the people know I will be back. And here it is, we're uh, trying to encourage him, and he encourages us in, in the toughest time of his life. It says a great deal about his character and his heart. In Seattle, Mike's parents were informed of the injury. That phone call was not, not one you wanted to hear. His football career is probably over with, and we're worrying about getting him to walk. It was, it was bad. It's just a matter of what, what the doctors can do. Back in Detroit, a whole team of doctors were attending to Mike. I'm laying there, 
legs still burning, arms still burning, and the pain absolutely just extraordinary in the backside of the neck. Mike was then taken into surgery to have his broken neck wired back together. I broke my fifth, sixth, and seventh vertebra, completely crushed them. They had to go in, take bone from my hip, and wired it back up so I was able to be stabilized. The doctor's efforts to rewire Mike's neck were successful, but their attempts to repair his central nervous system were not. While not completely severed, Mike's spinal cord was severely damaged. This was a massive injury. He left him in the state that we would call quadriplegic, in which case he had no movement of his legs, no triceps, wrist, fingers, trunk, or anything in the lower extremities. I couldn't feel anything from my mid chest down. My left side was paralyzed, nothing. When I first saw him in the hospital, I said, Mike, squeeze my hand, and he could barely move his fingers. Doctor comes into my room and all of a sudden says, son, you broke your neck and you'll never walk again. I got angry. That's when I told him, don't tell me or anybody you can't do something, and I asked him to get out of my room. The doctors told Mike that in addition to never being able to walk again, there was only a small window of time for him to regain feeling in his arms, hands, and upper body. Whatever function he regained in the next six to 12 months would be all that he would ever regain. The spinal cord is made up of central nervous system cells, and if any cells in the spinal cord should die, they cannot be replaced and therefore will never function. It didn't matter. I didn't listen to him. You start looking at my MRIs, you can still see healthy spinal cord cells. Sure, there was a lot of damage and a lot of black spots, but there was some clear healthy cells through there, which means there was a chance for me to come back. How far I'd come back, I didn't know. So right then and there, there was tremendous amount of hope. That's all I ever hung on to is that word hope. We just wish the best for Mike as a friend and a teammate. There is a chance, and uh, we're believing in that chance right now. If he can stay optimistic about it, I mean, why can't we? This guy will be a champion, and he'll be a super role model for anybody else that has to go through this thing. Mike eventually stabilized and was released from the hospital in early December. He immediately entered the Craig Rehabilitation Hospital in Denver. He did a lot of hard work to gain increase in function, and he gained some increases during that time, those first six months, in some strength, particularly to biceps and wrist extensors. Are you catching up? <laughs> but he couldn't gain more than that. One of the things that rehabilitation does is it teaches you to be functional with what you have. I had to learn to feed myself. I had to learn to take care of myself. Every single basic function, going to bathroom, shaving, shopping, doing laundry, I had to learn all over again. One of these big memories I had was, was a Super Bowl Sunday, 1992. As a ball player and as a grown man at uh, 26 years old, it's time for a beer. And so I left the hospital without permission, wheeled up about four blocks to the convenience store, and I said, sir, I need a 40-ouncer. And I was wheeling myself back to Craig Hospital to the rec department to sit down in front of the big screen TV, and I put my beer up on the, uh, the table. It took me an hour and a half to get this beer open. I sat there and I poured that beer by myself into a little glass and I proceeded to pick that glass up and take a big, long drink. Mike was released from Craig Hospital in April of 1992. The small window of time the doctors had given him to regain feeling and function was closing fast and Mike still had very little use of his hands and upper body. It was then that he learned of biofeedback technology. Biofeedback is a type of learning for people to learn control of physiological responses. The process itself involves putting electrodes on muscles which are non-functional. And what they're measuring is how much motor signal comes from the brain 
through the spinal cord to that muscle. Just try to bring up the front of that foot, good. These electrodes are then connected to a series of computers and presented on a monitor in front of the person. Utilizing this technique for over 20 years, Dr. Brucker's biofeedback lab has helped restore motor function to patients with severe central nervous system damage. Hey, that was good. <laughs> Amazing, huh? Achievement. That's right. <laughs> All right. In Mike's case, it turns out that not as many cells in the spinal cord were damaged as his surgeon initially thought. We had to teach the brain how to find pathways in the spinal cord that repaired that the brain couldn't find otherwise and make that connection to the muscle. The first day they hooked up where I was most deficit was in the hands. I started working with it. And that night, after that one hour session, is the first time I started moving my one finger. I was pointing out something I wanted and I actually opened up my finger and pointed where I couldn't do that the day before or even that morning. Oh my God. There was a muscle that had not worked in six months. There, after increasing signal down the spinal cord, this finger extends out. It was just momentous and an emotional point for all of us. After I got hurt, I still wanted the adrenaline rush. I still wanted the excitement. It's awesome, man. It's awesome. Even for a split second, I actually forgot that I was paralyzed again. One of the first things I remember after getting a spinal cord injury going through Craig Hospital is wanting to drive again. For me, that's independence. You do it by first, power yourself up, up into the chair, bringing the feet up next, getting yourself square, locking yourself in with your seat belt. The hand controls I have is a push for the brake down towards the knee for the gas and then you're off to the races. The first time I started driving was complete freedom. I could go out on dates, I can, you know, take myself to meet my buddies. Being free is the greatest thing in the world. Today, Mike enjoys most of the same freedoms as any able-bodied person. But back in 1992, he was still struggling to regain movement in his upper body. One of his first major breakthroughs came during a biofeedback session in Miami, where he began to regain some feeling. Emboldened by the results, Mike returned to Denver, charged with the task of building strength to match this newly found motor function. First time, I wheeled up to a full-length mirror, and I was a shell of what I used to be. I lost 105 pounds of muscle. Vain as it may be, I did not like the way I looked. I hated it. I started looking around for other people that knew about spinal cord injuries and lifting weights. One day I found the owner of Gold's Gym and he happened to be training another gentleman, Tim Patterson, who happened to be a spinal cord para. Back in 1980, 19... 79, I went into the United States military. I was in the car and it was really bad weather. And the back wheel slid on the ice and just rolled over one time. It was just a real freak accident. And I turned around and, you know, made sure everyone was okay. Not a bump, scratch, bruise. Like, all right, let's keep going. I turned the car on and uh, couldn't move my legs. And uh, called the ambulance and took me to the hospital. And the doctor told me, he goes, hey, listen, you know, your back is broken. You never walk again. In 10 years after his accident, Tim began competing in wheelchair basketball and weightlifting contests. He then learned to hand cycle and began racing competitively. But it was when he met Mike Utley that Tim Patterson found his competitive kindred spirit. He was always a very positive person. Ever every, every since I met him, he was pretty happy-go-lucky. Mike still knows one day that he's going to walk again, they're going to find a cure, and you, know, and you still got to take care of your body. 
because they might find a cure and put you back together. When it comes to hanging out with other guys in chairs, there's very few people that I truly do hang out with, and uh, by God, Tim is one of them. Every now and then you wake up and just, you know, this, this just sucks being in a wheelchair. I hate being in a wheelchair. And it's like, I understand Mike and I'm, I'm the exact same way. You gotta choose every single day the way you wanna live your life. And uh, basically I just kinda follow the way he's doing it. Inspired by his friend in the weight room, Mike was eager to begin trying sports normally reserved for people with no disability at all. After I got hurt, I still wanted the adrenaline rush, so I went up the bunny hill and I went straight down. It's awesome, man, it's awesome. For me to have that wind in my face, the chill of the air on my skin. Even for a split second, I actually forgot that I was paralyzed again. Another sport I picked up after my injury was scuba diving. It is something that allows me, even for a slight moment of time, to get in the water and be free of this chair. For the ultimate adrenaline rush, Mike tried skydiving. Wheeled out to the tarmac, got myself up in the plane, Finally, that door opens. And the pilot leans over to you and says, this is a one-way ticket. We'll see you at the bottom. Thirteen thousand feet. God, it was awesome. Flying freedom. I rolled over, I said, that was awesome, let's go again. He went after that with the same kind of approach that he did in football. Wherever he was in that sport, he was going to make sure that he made a higher goal and a higher goal until he made unbelievable achievement where people who don't have disabilities often don't even reach that level of accomplishment. But his accomplishments had come only through extremely hard and sometimes painful work in the weight room and during his yearly three-month stints at Biofeedback Therapy in Miami. Every year he came back and you could see in his uh, rehab and in the gym and he was getting stronger. He had use of fingers and thumb. His trunk balance was better. He hadn't told me how much he had changed and how much he'd been lifting and how he had increased his muscle mass and how tanned he was. <laughs> Something was happening down there that uh, was doing good. So good that Mike decided to make a major change in his life. Taking advantage of the freedom that his diligence had provided, Mike left Denver to move closer to home. He bought a house on a lake in eastern Washington. I had the opportunity to purchase a place in beautiful Wenatchee, Eastern Washington, and I moved out here of April 1st of 98. The next day, I went into town to find the Gold's Gym. While working out at the gym, Mike met Danny Anderson, a paramedic living in Wenatchee. I was working out at Gold's Gym with uh, the owner, Blair McKinney, and he was so excited that Mike Utley was coming in and um, I didn't know who that was. So he would tease Danny as he met her and we had fun and with that, some interchange in between the workouts. And then he started to ask more and more questions about Danny. Mike was never a person that had problem with the ladies. 
He's so larger than life that, that you don't even notice his wheelchair. And I, I've never once noticed it uh, when I first met him or even up until now. Five months after they started dating, Danny moved in with Mike. Three years later, they were married. It says a great deal for her personality, her character, her heart, that she starts a relationship, dates, and eventually marries a man that's, that's in a wheelchair. Everybody's concerned that, you know, whether they have freckles or the size of their nose or, you know, whether their hair is falling out. But what if you, your legs didn't work, if your arms didn't work? She was able to look past his physical abilities at the time and, and look to, to his heart and his mind. She is dedicated and she's very understanding and she met him after his injury. So uh, we feel very fortunate to have her in the family. In the seven years since his injury, Mike had taken back the life that was ripped away from him on the football field. He regained control of much of his body and all of his life. But for the former NFL lineman, whose dream it was to return to Ford Field one day and walk off under his own power, it wasn't enough. Mike needed his legs back. When we started and we did those first measurements, they were pretty much zero. Five years we have tested. I was gaining everyone else. I've had zero down my legs. And you're firing up in that good. Put that up higher, good. Get that line up there a little bit more if you can. Perfect, good. Okay. And that's when we had a breakthrough. I started getting two, three, four, five, six percent out of my hip flexors. Then out of my quads, I started getting just a little bit out of my hamstrings. Perfect. Perfect, okay. Fired these quadriceps, which he had built very strongly, and the signal moved up to the next most critical level and he pushed himself up from that wheelchair with us just holding him on the side for balance. Good, Good. push, excellent, come on. Push up there a little bit more on these guys. Get him up there. Terrific, come up there a little bit higher. Good, that's it. Good, terrific. Good, up there a little bit more. Perfect, okay. And was up. standing on his own legs for the first time. We were all amazed. Mike would hang on to the parallel bars, shift weight, pick up a foot, and he just stepped. And he would unload and swing and fight, and the other foot came through, and he, and he stepped. Being on the water is one of these things that a person can get out there and be by himself and be at peace. Being on the river like this, I just had to have a boat. So that's when I got myself a 29-foot fountain. Being able to get down this river, um, I get to play like everyone else. I think the biggest feeling is basically freedom. You gotta love life when you're doing those kind of things. After watching everybody else have the fun on these sea dews, it was Mike's turn. I went to a local dealer in town here and I just said, I need two that are the fastest ones you've got. The one drug I enjoy the most is called adrenaline. And for me to be able to get 80 plus miles an hour, and this is something I've always enjoyed to do, now I'm able to do it continuously every day on this beautiful, beautiful water. In 1991, doctors told Mike Utley that not only would he never walk again, but that he would probably never regain feeling in his upper body as well. By 1998, he had become a virtual case study in spinal cord research. 
almost full motor function had returned to his entire upper body. And most astonishing, his legs began to slowly function as well. I had enough strength to bring my knee straight up and straight back down. This set all new goals for Mike. And he knew that he must first take these muscles in these legs and begin to rebuild that muscle tissue. Well, if anybody knows how to build muscle, Mike's the guy. Mike immediately returned to Gold's gym in Wenatchee. We ended up obtaining some parallel bars and we worked with uh, Blair McCaney at the gym and we just started doing all these different type of exercises. We were getting him standing in the parallel bars about three times a week. First time it was uh, exhilarating, spooky, a little freaky because he was so stinking tall. Mike would hang onto the parallel bars, shift weight, pick up a foot, and he just stepped. And then he shifted weight, and he would unload and swing and fight, and the other foot came through, and he, and he stepped. Wanting to share his progress with the world, Mike decided to hold a press conference in which he would walk on television. Even for Mike, this was rather bold because he had just crossed this threshold. You know, and anything could happen. There's a small part of me that wanted to get back at the doctors for saying, you can't do this. Therapists, there's a new realm out there. Wow. <laughs> I didn't expect so many people to show up. Wow. It took us both by surprise that the room was just packed. Now, I want to show you guys what my life's all about taking these steps here for you guys today. As I watched this, my heart was in my mouth. It took every bit of muscle I had in my legs. I took that first step. I locked the hip back. I pulled the knee back. One went after another. Every ounce of him was in making that step. It was just breathtaking. It was the most exciting moment of my life. Hold up, Mike. See him go through that battle of, of walking, how much effort and intensity he put into it was just amazing. Everybody in the gym stopped to watch it. It was a very proud moment for me and for the people that helped, and I think for the entire gym. It took me eight years to take my first steps again, and that was to give thanks to everyone that had supported me, but most importantly, to close that one chapter and one day walk off Ford Field. He just keeps trying and trying and knows that one day he's going to get out of that wheelchair and he's going to walk on the 50-yard line. And I, I, I know it'll happen. He'll take steps or he will die trying. Stay center. Drive. Stay focused and intense. Good job. Move. Be a jackhammer, Mike. Rapid fire. Just like a jackhammer. Good job, Mike. Time. Because we're going to use the on the bone and we're going to break collarbones. Break this arm off. Excellent. The newest member of the Yetley team, so to speak is Joseph Seminet. He's a martial arts instructor. Let's go. Take it down. He's pushing me beyond what I could do before. Tomorrow I'm going to be better than I was today. Mr. Seminet has a beautiful dojo up in Chelan. 
the area that we are able to train brings peace internally. He's been training with me about six weeks. He's doing things now that are black belt level. His ability to adapt to my movement is extraordinary. Really, a nice cut. Now I have a coach as I had when I played ball in college in the pros. I would rather work with Mike Utley than most of my students. He doesn't give up, he doesn't whine, and he wants to train harder. Excellent. Use your C-lot elbow. Watching uh, Joseph just go full bore with Mike is, is incredible. It's exactly what Mike wants, it's exactly what he's been looking for. He's a big haymaker. The more I give him, the more he likes it. Give some power. Come on, Mike. Mike wants me to hit him as hard as I can all the time. Let's go! Give it to me! Come on! Let's go, Mike! Come on! You know, my goal is to use this, utilize Mr. Joseph in his training to one day allow me to walk off Ford Field. In addition to martial arts training, Mike also spends time on the shooting range at the Simonette compound. I've never run around anybody like Mike before, a quadriplegic that shoots, uh, just incredible. Yeah, let's get out uh, the great 357 Magnum, Smith & Wesson, beautiful gun. Good job, Mike. After my accident, it probably took three and a half years before I first picked up a gun again. And it got to a point where my hands started coming back. I started with a 22, now I'm back up to 357. Mike's shooting, he's got such great control on that handgun that when he fires the last shot, there's actually no more shells left. There's no flinch whatsoever. Excellent control. Okay, this is my M16 SWAT weapon. Got a magazine here loaded with 69 grain Federal hollow point ammunition. Okay, like this. The shooting came back and said, you know, Mike, you're all right, but you've got to earn the right to go back and be what you were before. And now that I'm there, I have to earn to be better than I was. Absolutely awesome. <laughs> the barrel remains right on target, whether or not he's shooting. Frankly, I wish all my cops shot that well. Mom, I got to have one. One of my goals is to reach up to the Smith & Wesson 500. It's the biggest, baddest thing out there. The 50 caliber, the big boy on the block now, Dirty Harry is no more. Now, we're gonna work with Mike on this. Eventually, he's gonna work up being able to shoot this bad bear. He did go right through the stump. This is what therapy will allow me to do down the road. Right now, it's a little much for me, but I will get this one. This is mine. It has my name all over it. Mike has already been one of the greatest success stories in spinal cord injury that have ever existed. He said he wants to go back to Detroit and walk, uh, walk off the field. And I think someday he will. come out and stand here about twice a week. I enjoy more competitive ordeals, but this is a tool. It's a, it's a necessity. It's, um, it's what I have to do. What allows me to do is the weight bear on my ankles, my knees, my hips. It allows my heart to continuously pump blood from my feet to my brain 
and it's back and forth. That's the first start of walking. The view at 6'6 is a lot different than the view at 5'2, let's put it that way. Being able to get back and, and stand and have the heart strong enough where I can maintain the 6'6 posture that I once had, it's a good thing. And it's a start though. It's truly a start for where I want to be. In the 14 years since his injury, Mike Utley has become a symbol of determination. Combining a wide range of traditional and radical therapies, he has forged a new path for victims of spinal cord injuries. He now lives a life fuller than most able-bodied people. Good job, good job. Yet it is not just his zest for life that inspires others. We're diehards, aren't we, boss? We are, yes, we are. Just weeks after being injured, Mike formed the Mike Utley Thumbs Up Foundation for Spinal Cord Research. When I started the Mike Utley Foundation back in 1992, it was to reach out to people, number one, to give them education about spinal cord injuries. But the bottom line is to help find a cure for paralysis. He could have put all his efforts towards finding out something to help himself, but he started a foundation to help other people also. What are you working on here? Um, I've been working on my uh, back extensions, Good for my you. triceps, and they started this year on my legs. He's gained certain information and knowledge, and he wanted to share that with others. It takes it takes a while, doesn't it? it takes a long this, time. My, this is my uh, third full year, but my I go out and do speaking engagements, corporate, to all the way down to grade schools to motivate people to get out there and be the best they can be. Do something for themselves today they didn't do yesterday but always compete against yourself because that's always the hardest thing to do. Since its inception, the foundation has raised $2 million for spinal cord research through special events and the ever-moving words of Mike himself. Don't tell me I can't do something. Don't tell anybody else I can't do something either because you've set your mind to it. You can do anything you want because your mind's a powerful thing. If you believe in yourself, you can do it. Mike has done so many things. He's, he's skydived, scuba dived, and when he goes and speaks, he'll ask them, you know, has, have you guys skydived? Have you scuba dived? I go skiing at Vail. George asked my therapist, well, how does Mike stop? Two condos and a cement wall near the bottom of the hill. <laughs> People can look at themselves and say, you know, I gotta get going. If he can do this, then I can too. When you push yourself today harder than you ever have, you will find new ways, other ways around adversity. But it takes a lot of hard work to do that. And it takes having the right attitude. And if anybody's got the right attitude, Mike is the one. That attitude will hopefully one day help Mike fulfill his dream. He said he wants to go back to the Detroit and walk, uh, walk off the field. And I think someday he will. Do I think Mike's goal is realistic? Yes, I do. He may not walk like you or I walk, but he'll take steps or he will die trying. He just keeps trying and trying and knows that one day he's going to get out of that wheelchair and he's going to walk on the 50-yard line. And I, I, I know it'll happen. If he doesn't attain this ultimate goal, it is not a failure in any way, shape, or form. Because Mike has already been one of the greatest success stories in spinal cord injury that have ever existed. It's, it's definitely not the end all. The end all is to, to be happy, to be productive, to leave this world a, a better place. Mike goes through his life with joy, he goes through his life fearless, and he goes through his life working his ass off to achieve a goal. That's the legacy. The dedication of the blood, the sweat, and the tears that I have given to become a pro has allowed me to be here today. I understand football put me in a wheelchair, but football is also going to teach me how to get out, how to one day walk off that Ford Field.